I think it's time for us to talk transparently about our situation going forward, especially as it pertains to things like gun policy and gun control. And since we'll be talking about guns and the state of Western masculinity, I want to clarify that I condemn and disavow all violence. That being said, my position, I do want to say on President Trump hasn't changed at all. I still stand by what I said with the MAGA hat will never come off. But that was, of course, to serve as a symbol for the fact that we aren't giving up on President Trump. It doesn't literally mean that you can't take the hat off. So I'm just going to have it there on the desk because it's my birthday, which means I can wear whatever I want. No suit today. We're going casual to Tuesday mode, and it also means that you have to listen all the way through, because it's my birthday, which means that everyone has to be super nice to me. Plus, I can assure you that this is going to be one of the most insightful and intelligent videos that you've ever seen as it pertains to the state of gun control in America, the state of masculinity in America, etc. This is seriously going to be important for you to understand exactly what's going on in our country, why it's happening, how we can fix it, and what's going to happen if we don't fix it. And this video is about to blow your freaking mind. All the necessary components are there, which are just that I'm caffeinated out of my mind right now. It's 2 a.m. Let's do this. Do stay tuned. John Doyle in. Heck off, Kami. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Heck Off, Kami. I know what you're thinking. I know, I know, I know. It's going to be hard to just dive right in because everyone wants to tell me how intelligent and handsome I am. Everyone wants to know what to get me for my birthday. Just get a membership over at heckoffkami.com. That's the best thing because then I can keep doing this and I love doing this, which is why I'm here today. And I know that you will eventually because eventually you will realize the importance of this. It's only a matter of time. But I will say that if you do it now, you'll have the opportunity to get the free and official HOC Christmas card. And if you're a high IQ member, you will have the opportunity to get the 2020 HOC Christmas sweater. And it's all very epic. And I already know that you will because this video is going to end up being so important to you and to so many others that you'll have no choice but to support the channel. But in all seriousness, it is important that you watch this all the way through because it is incredibly important subject matter. And also given how utterly caffeinated I am, I can't promise that it's going to be concise. I'm going to tie it all together in the end, but I'm probably going to jump around a little bit here. I even I told someone one time because I think that I always do really good work when I'm highly caffeinated. But I told him, I was like, yeah, whenever I'm on camera, I'm usually just coked out of my effing mind. And they believed me. They believed me. But no, no, we went to Big B Coffee, making the best of Michigan before we go Texas mode. We ended up getting two 24 ounce coffees because I think that I think this is really important stuff. And I want to make sure that we do a good job talking about it. So basically, we're going to start with gun control, uh, specifically Joe Biden's plans for gun control if and when he takes power. And again, I don't know what's going to happen there, but I think that this is important to discuss regardless. And we're going to get into how this is all related to men and masculinity and power and how the abuse of all of those has basically damned our country. But I want to first start with a story that I think serves as a nice introduction to a lot of what we're going to be talking about right now. So basically, it goes like this. A couple months ago, one of my buddies was on the highway, headed to the required class to get your CPL, which is a concealed pistol license for those unfamiliar. So part of the class is actually shooting pistols at targets, practicing different drills, uh, mechanics, etc. So they ask that you bring a pistol and about 100 rounds of ammunition for it. So this guy got one of his pistols uh, that was legally registered to him and through a private sale, which is how you get pistols in Michigan. If you're under 21, you go, you get a purchase permit from your local police department. They do the background check there. And then once you complete the deal with the person, uh, you bring it back to them and they update the registration for that pistol in their system. And then you've got 10 days to bring it back to them after the transaction or else it's a misdemeanor. So anyways, Michigan state law says that if you don't have a CPL, you can only transport a pistol in your car if you're going to a place that directly pertains to the pistol, like a, like a range or a gunsmith, gun show, something like that, or public or private land where you're allowed to use guns, uh, police department, or if you're moving things from your home or business to another home or business. Other than that, you can't really transport your pistol in your vehicle. You can't like take it to your buddy's house to show them. You can't really do much else with it. That's the law. And then... Even if you are transporting it to one of those places that we mentioned, you have to have the pistol unloaded and separate from its ammunition and then in a locked case in the trunk of the car. So this guy's not that smart. So guess what he does? He puts his pistol in the case with the magazine inserted, around chambered, and it's in the back seat of his car. It gets worse. He then proceeds to speed pretty significantly on the way to the class, and it gets worse yet again. Because not only is he speeding, he's on his phone, changing songs, texting people, whatever. So he doesn't see the state trooper on the side of the road up ahead. And by the time he does, it's too late. And so the Cop clocks him, goes after him. By now he knows he's screwed because he's smart enough to know the laws, but he's also anti-government enough to think that they're stupid. I think we can all, you know, sympathize with that to a certain extent. But anyways, he knows that the cop is going to see the pistol in the back seat, and he figures that it's better to just declare it up front rather than have the cop find it and get mad that he didn't declare it. And so 
you know, some of you might disagree with that approach, but regardless, he tells the cop about the pistol, uh, that he's on his way to the class, etc. So the cop takes the pistol, goes back to the car for about 20 minutes, so he's sitting there, he's anxious, he knows that it is literally a possibility at this point that he gets arrested for felony weapons charges on the way to his CPL class. Cop comes back, says, you know, open your trunk. So he does, the cop puts the pistol in the trunk, comes back over and says, don't try to fight this ticket because I'm giving you a break on the gun. You know that's a felony, right? And he's like, yes, sir, I apologize. Thank you so much, sir. You know, I'm sorry for the inconvenience and for wasting your time. And the cop says, yeah, you know, you're welcome. Drive safe. Uh, and, and that's the end of it. So initial takeaway, that kid got pretty damn lucky that the cop was so cool. His life and future with firearms could have been seriously debilitated if that cop decided such was the appropriate course of action. But he came out OK. Cop probably thought, OK, here's this punk kid. He was polite. He immediately declared the firearm. He knows he could be screwed. He's about to learn everything in this class. Probably not exactly a danger to society. He's probably too freaked out to ever do it again. So, you know, it's probably not really worth throwing the book at this kid for this. So the cop made a judgment call. And I think that was the right call to make. So is this kid lucky? Yeah. Is the cop a pretty cool guy? Yeah. I want to go a little bit deeper with that, though, because I hear that story. My first instinct is, wow, you got lucky. You're an idiot. And that's definitely pretty accurate. And then I think, wow, that cop is a really cool guy, which I think is also pretty accurate. But let's talk about the system that the officer was serving, because that system can still be bad, even if the officer was a cool guy in that particular circumstance. And a lot of times people think that just because I don't like libertarians, that I'm like this big authoritarian, big government type, I'm actually pretty radically anti-government on a lot of things, especially things like this. So let me tell you another way that I interpret this story. This kid enthusiastically thanked this police officer for only fining him a couple hundred dollars for moving two fast at about eight in the morning on empty taxpayer funded roads and not additionally charging him with a literal felony for carrying his property in the incorrect location of his other property. Get what I'm saying? Like, should we really reward someone for choosing to basically not be the biggest dick that the system enables them to be? Like, wow, officer, thank you so much for fining me, for moving too fast for your liking on this empty road, and for not also arresting me and charging me with a felony because my property was a few feet away from where it should have been within my other property. Thank you for protecting and serving me, officer. Do you want to have sex with my wife? I backed the blue. And this isn't to say that cops are bad people. This is just to say that we have a tendency, you know, to shower police officers with praise for simply not screwing us over as much as they could, given how unjust the system is, particularly with something like this. It reminds me of the concept of slave morality. Like, was it a smart move to thank the officer? Yeah. Yeah, it's always the best move to be polite, uh, to cooperate. And I think that this officer is probably a generally good dude. But what I'm trying to say is that we cannot allow ourselves to celebrate the best case scenarios of a system that is fundamentally against us and against our God-given rights and that exists as the enforcement for a state that effectively hates us and wants to rob us of our way of life. That's my point. The fact that if the cop weren't so understanding, this kid would have basically been totally screwed because the pistol wasn't in the place that the state says that it has to be, and it wasn't stored in the way that the state says that it has to be stored. And this is why it reminded me of the concept of slave morality, which is attributed to Nietzsche, who was a German philosopher, for those unfamiliar. And the idea of slave morality is basically that you are rationalizing your position as a slave to be a virtue. You exist as a slave. You don't exist in a position of power. And you are rationalizing that to be a virtue by emphasizing things like obedience, patience, humility, or even weakness and pacifism. The idea that victimhood is something to aspire to, that there's something noble about victimhood, that's all slave morality. The idea that it is good to be humble and patient and obedient when the officer contemplates whether to charge us with a felony because we didn't transport our property within our other property in the correct manner as defined by the state. And, you know, maybe you don't agree with that specific example. Again, we're not saying the cop is a bad person, but the point is to illustrate the reality of the system that we live in and its effects on us and whether it's really serving our interests. But more broadly speaking, with our explanation of slave morality, you may have noticed, I'm sorry I'm adjusting my glasses so much, cameraman Badan stepped on them. You may have noticed it rings a bell uh, with what's going on in our society and what we're witnessing, which is of course the age-old conflict between good and evil. But this time it can more articulately be described as the strong minority versus the weak majority. The strong with fewer numbers, but greater individual power and the weak with greater numbers, but less individual power. And the weak essentially attack all that is strong because it reminds them of their inadequacies, whether it's one man or whether it's an entire society, especially if that society was built by the strong men that they resent. And this is why leftism, properly defined, is the condition of being insecure and over-socialized. It is much less a political philosophy and much more a condition that is a result of mental illness. And the power structure in this country, the American regime, it breeds mental illness. 
insecurity being part of that. And it uses its privatized propaganda apparatuses to propagate the appropriate narratives throughout the entirety of the culture, resulting effectively in over-socialization due to the overwhelming force of mass propaganda and the resultant mass conformity. This is why the largest and most powerful demographic that participate in these trends are always white, college-educated, upper-middle-class people who identify with these minority and special interest groups precisely because they view them as inferior and because it makes them feel as though they have purpose to fight on their behalf, because they feel as though they have no purpose in their own lives, and they feel as though they don't have power. And they compensate for their lack of individual power in groups. Think Antifa, think Black Lives Matter, or with exaggerated and emotionally charged displays of aggression. You'll notice that these types of men will become very emotional, they're very quick to aggression, uh, and this is not the way that a man would actually behave, but rather the way that a woman would behave if you just increased her strength by about 10%, considering how weak these types of men usually are. This is why they behave that way publicly or even behind their keyboards. You'll notice that they say things that people who are secure with themselves uh, really would never say. Like, they'll leave comments about me like, oh, I could break him in half, and I'm just like, <laughs> shut up, hippie. Because their entire political framework is nothing more than weakness and the projection of insecurity. It's not a coincidence that I have never been criticized by someone better looking than me. It's really not a coincidence. Leftism is simply the political manifestation of a pathological need for power. And that is dangerous if left unchecked, pun intended. Because there are no ends which satiate the pathology because it is not about the ends. It's about manufacturing meaning in one's life out of a feeling of inferiority and inadequacy. Why do you think these types tend to be mentally ill? Why do you think that they tend to want to make themselves unattractive, as unattractive as possible? Almost as if to say, I'm not good looking, but instead of trying to make myself better looking, I'm going to make myself as hideous as possible to assert my belief that there is no such thing as objective beauty standards. Uh, because if there were, well, I wouldn't be able to compete. They're rejecting that idea. It's the same thing, fear of competition. You see this in all of their policies. It's why they want state-enforced equality, fear of competition, symptomatic of their insecurities. And it's these people working for these purposes that seek to literally destroy all that reminds them of their inadequacies, all that is good, all that was created by the strong. And if left unchecked, that results in the collapse of our society. And that's why it is the job of the conservative, by definition, to prevent that and to conserve the traditional American society. The conservative must utilize power to control the cultural and societal entropy. Because if he doesn't, there will soon be nothing left to conserve, because such is the nature of leftism and such has become more broadly the nature of our society as men have become generally much weaker because a man without a purpose, something to give himself to, something to, to care about, something to produce, without that, he will become apathetic towards his environments and he will be concerned only with consumption. Not production, consumption. He will be concerned only with distracting himself from the otherwise meaningless life that he lives. And the deterioration of masculinity, I think, has a lot to do with the American attitude towards guns. And I know the left likes to say, oh, well, gun owners only have guns because they're insecure with their masculinity. They have a tiny peepee, -pee, which is, of course, a huge projective cope. But regardless, I do think that there's something to say about guns as one of the last staples of American masculinity. Because for a long time in this country, there were just certain things that men knew how to do. And one of those things was properly handle and use a firearm. And as we've lost so many other components of masculinity some of you might be thinking, well, what other components? Because no one even knows or remembers what they were. But now we have this very in your face, come and take it kind of gun culture, which is relatively new in terms of our history. And I'm not saying that it's a bad thing. I actually think that it's a good thing to be outspokenly pro-gun. I just think that it's indicative of how the American man has become so feminized that we now basically have one last significant point of defense, and it's our guns. But that being said, we still have the results of that conditioning to where a lot of us, despite supposedly being pro-Second Amendment, we retain that slave morality. We'll say things like, well, we don't really need much else than hunting rifles. Well, there's really no need for 30-round magazines. Oh, well, we should really just be grateful that the state lets us have handguns. We don't need rifles for self-defense, etc. And it's like, what happened? Did your balls drop off? See, a guy like me... Look, the point is gun control isn't really about saving lives, keeping people safe. Of course not. We know that. We know that. The people calling for gun control have never been involved with firearms before seriously. They have no idea what they're talking about. The same way the people who criticize police officers for employing lethal force. They have no idea what they're talking about. Well, why did you have to shoot him so many times? Well, why didn't you just shoot him in the leg? Well, why didn't you know that in real life, your shots don't show up. You can't actually see if you've hit the person. They have so much adrenaline during that moment that their blood literally flows away from the surface of their skin. And if you shoot them, they won't immediately start gushing blood like in the movies. Plus, they typically won't even feel the shot. It's still very easy to be in the fight after you've been shot. People describe it like a stinging feeling followed by like a warm feeling. But otherwise, you can still easily be in the fight. But people who have never even been in a fist fight, they want to tell police officers or gun owners how they should properly go about defending themselves so as to optimize the well-being of the person who is trying to kill them. They don't know anything about guns, the function, the engineering, nothing. And with these new gun control measures from Joe Biden, for example, 
We know that from a policy perspective, they're ineffective. We've proven that. We've gone into great detail just on this channel before, but that's not the point. And I'm not going to break down the, the specifics of what he's trying to do here, but I'll say it's a lot. And very little of it has to do with just straight up taking people's guns. It has much more to do with simply making the process of obtaining a gun substantially more difficult for the average American. And that's the true point. The point of the plan is really to distract us and to make it harder through regulation for normal people to obtain a firearm to where it's really not even worth their efforts anymore. That way, we as gun owners become more marginalized, we become more fringe so that eventually they could really accelerate things because voters would think, oh yeah, who cares? No one has guns anymore. Since the anti-gun culture will have been so normalized by then. And it's the same thing, even with the emphasis on taking assault weapons, right? It serves to distract us from trying to avoid losing ground on other more practical elements of gun control, which then reduces the accessibility and practicality of firearms to the average person. And that serves to aid them for if and when they decide to go full gun control mode, because by that point, the only people who will have guns will be the gun enthusiasts. And we won't have the cultural representation left at that point to fight back legislatively. Interpret that as you will, though I emphasize this is not a call to action. I disavow all violence and I condemn all violence. But, you know, whether we have total gun confiscation or total gun deregulation, the point still remains true. And we'll get in deeper with this momentarily. But as long as men are weak, as long as the masses are impotent, you will never take the country back. You will never convince a weak man that a system that emphasizes the importance of good, the importance of true liberty, the importance of competition, which is really just an acknowledgement of the importance of competence and the, the reality of human nature, and the reason for that is that system is fundamentally a right-wing system. That does not exist to benefit the weak man. But the weak man still has an instinct to survive. He still has an instinct to seek that which purports to produce the best outcome for him. And that system will be a left-wing system that emphasizes equality, tolerance, etc. Or in other words, the virtues of the weak and the morality of the slave. It is not easy to reverse because it requires sacrifice and effort. It requires us to push the rock uphill, but it's unavoidable that so long as we live in a society that breeds mental illness, that displaces the role of men, that feminizes them, that condemns and displaces authentic masculinity, you will have generations of weak men. And when you have generations of weak, insecure men who see no purpose to their lives, they will dedicate themselves to that which preserves their comfort, which is the state and the expansion of the state, which is done by pledging allegiance to the narratives of the incumbent regime. And I'm not talking about Barack Obama, George Bush, etc. I'm talking about the American regime enforced by the administrative state, aka the deep state, and propagated by the apparatuses which are occupied by the same types of actors that serve as an extension of the American regime by propagating the approved narratives throughout the media, throughout Hollywood, every level of education, the workforce, virtually everywhere in society except for maybe the My Pillow factory. This video is not officially sponsored by Mike Lindell, nor is it officially sponsored by My Pillow, but you should still go buy a My Pillow because they are epic and Mike Lindell will be the savior of the West. So true. It's so true. You can't escape it. You can't escape it. And that's by design because the success and continuation of what we're referring to here as the American regime is contingent upon the submission and the enthusiasm of the masses. And the submission is contingent upon weak and demoralized men. And the enthusiasm is contingent upon using their propaganda to convince the aforementioned masses that to pledge allegiance to the narratives of the state is to give purpose to their otherwise meaningless lives, aside from, of course, consumerism and hedonism. And that doing so will ensure a greater level of comfort for themselves and for those who they perceive to be even weaker and lower than themselves. Think why White liberals. We all know about this. We all know that white liberals demonstrate surprising levels of racist and condescending behavior towards minorities while supposedly claiming to want to help them. Okay, why is that? Because they implicitly view them to be even lower than themselves. They literally have a savior complex. That is from where they derive a large proportion of their meaning in life, of their purpose in life. And the beauty of that system is that it's self-perpetuating. It is a self-sustaining system. And the reason for that is once you make weakness and its adjacent ethics the moral framework of society, people will use that to force others to conform, not only because what we know about the general psychology of social conformity, but because when you have bred generations of weak men, they will evangelically act on behalf of that weakness against the minority of strong men because their existence reminds the weak men of their insecurities, which makes them anxious, which is a disruption of the comfort that was afforded to them by the state in exchange for their work in upholding and serving its purposes and its narratives. And this is a very natural consequence of human nature when channeled for the purpose of evil. You might remember that we talk a lot about how there's really no such thing as the individual because people are basically sheep and they basically lack agency. And that is true, but that is not inherently a bad thing. And this might sound weird, probably even off-putting. Just hear me out. 
Every man who stormed the beaches of Normandy on D-Day, if you could go back in time and talk to them, every man who stormed those beaches, literally getting gored by MG42s, literally watching your friends fall apart like soggy gingerbread men. Maybe that's a weird way of putting it, but I think it still illustrates basically what was happening to these men who were my age, many of them even younger. The point is that if you could go back and you could talk to these men, they would not all be able to articulate to you exactly why they were there as far as the strategy behind the operation, the implications for the German morale, etc. And they shouldn't be expected to do that because all that mattered was that they were serving a cause that was greater than themselves and that was for good. You get what I mean? Because quite often I see conservatives wasting their time and wasting their breath trying to convince people, oh, well, you just you just have to read this. You just have to study this. You just have to follow this information with exactly the same level of interest and depth that I do. That's just not how people are, because the reality is that most people simply aren't that interested. And that's okay. So the point is that not everyone is going to have the inclination nor the capacity to really think for themselves. And that's okay because that's just the reality of human nature. So our problem, properly understood, isn't that people don't think for themselves. It's that those who control the flow of information are indoctrinating them into effectively serving the ends of evil and the destruction of our nation. And the point of the D-Day example was to say that countless times throughout the history of the world, and even our country more specifically, the success of good was contingent upon the willingness of men to pledge themselves to that cause, which is greater than themselves and be willing to die for it, comfortable in the knowledge that they have died serving good. And that given that death is inevitable, given that death is certain, it's preferable to die for something good than it is to live a life without purpose and a life that is artificially comforting so as to reduce your anxiety about your inevitable death and about the reality of your own existence as an insignificant slave. And it's precisely this fear of death that allows for the perpetuation of the culture of comfort, of weakness weakness, etc. And for any man who identifies that this culture of weakness has allowed for the propagation of evil to be demonized and socially exiled by the masses for not only deviating from the approved narratives of the American regime on behalf of which the masses are working, but also because the drive of the good and strong man to correct the deterioration of his society serves to induce anxiety in the spirits of the weak men who have allowed themselves to be corrupted, demoralized, and degenerated by the state of our society. And so my point is that the iron law of natural existence is that power exists. Be comfortable with that fact. Power exists. When a lion tears a zebra's throat out, that's power. When someone steals your wallet at gunpoint, that's power. When you learn your lesson and you shoot the next guy who tries to steal your wallet at gunpoint six months later, that's power. Power and nature are intertwined. They're indissoluble. For a long time, we thought, well, if power exists, it could eventually be used for evil. And so the best thing that we can do is minimize that power. That sounded like a pretty good idea. And so in this country, we drafted a constitution which sought to minimize that power. And some of you might want to sit down for this one. Look where we are now. I hate to say it, but it's true. The Constitution effectively thought that it could minimize the reality of power, and less than 250 years later, we learned it's really not that simple. And I'm not against our Constitution, by the way. I love our Constitution. I keep one in the glove box of my car in case a police officer forgets about the Fourth Amendment. But what I'm asking you is this. If our Constitution was so great, how the hell did we end up here? And to this, the obvious response would be, well, we simply didn't listen to our Constitution. If we returned to true constitutionalism, then all of this would be okay. And I believed that for a while. I really did. But then I started to think about this a little bit more. And now I can't help but wonder what would prevent the same thing from happening over again. Why would us conducting a factory reset on our country result differently this time around as opposed to what's happened throughout the last 244 years, especially considering the fact that people in 1776 definitely and decidedly cared more about the actual values of the Constitution than people in 2020 do? It's undebatable, which tells us that the Constitution in itself has actually failed. And I know that this is hard to hear, but we can't keep lying to ourselves. And again, this doesn't mean that we need to like throw out the Constitution, but the Constitution is a means to an end. The only reason that we care about the Constitution is because it was supposed to serve as a means to the end of protecting the God-given rights of the American people. The actual Constitution doesn't matter. Like the piece of paper, literally speaking, it's no different than the Constitution of other countries, except maybe it's a little bit cooler because of the historical significance. Because what matters is what the Constitution was meant to protect, something that transcends writing into the immaterial, which are the God-given rights and well-being of the American people. And perhaps we'll get into detail with this at a later time, but essentially what happened is the Constitution failed to enforce itself or it created a system that had the capacity to not enforce it and to undermine it and to subvert it and to chip away at it, so to speak. And what was our plan to stop this from happening? I know it. You know it. I know that you know it. I know you're passionate about it because it's, of course, our Second Amendment. And we love our Second Amendment. But to be completely honest with you, because I'm nailing it right now and I see no reason to stop, as much as I love the Second Amendment, as much as I love guns, and as radically pro-gun as I am, I have actually come to regard the Second Amendment as a cope. I have actually come to regard the Second Amendment as effectively one of the most influential legal psyops in the history of the world. Hear me out. 
I would imagine, I would wager actually since I'm 21 now, I would wager that you and I agree that they will never actually totally disarm us. I would wager that you and I agree that they'll never really go door to door taking our guns. So today what I'm asking you is this, why is that? Why will they never do that, at least in the near future? Eventually it will probably happen as we talked about earlier, but why at least in the near future will that not happen? Why has it not happened yet? The typical response, which does make a lot of sense, would be, well, if they ever tried to do something like that, the citizens would fight back and it would be unsuccessful. That's basically the orthodox NRA talking point. The problem that I have with that idea is that it's very hard to square that hypothesis with the reality of our current society in terms of how much we've lost. And so instead, I would introduce to you this hypothesis, which is that they will never take our guns, not because they fear us, but because they know that they are more powerful when we keep our guns than they are if they were to disarm us. Because to truly have power over us is to maintain the illusion of freedom. Think about it. We are demoralized. We lose more freedom every year. Our culture is dying. Our country is being taken from us. But because we have our guns, we think that we're free. Because I can legally obtain an AR-15 in less time than it takes me to renew my driver's license. I think that I'm free. And that's how it should be since I have a right to a gun, not necessarily a right to driving. The point is that it would seem that the accepted hypothesis of the Second Amendment has failed. And again, this is not a call to action or violence. I condemn and disavow all of that. Seriously. But this is to say that if the Constitution was supposed to protect our God-given rights and the American people, and the Second Amendment was a fail-safe just in case that didn't work out, then what the hell happened? Do you get what I mean? We are pledging allegiance to a hypothesis that has failed and that has ultimately allowed us to get to where we are, which is as close as we've ever been to defeat. And we do this because we're convinced that our problem is just that we didn't execute the hypothesis properly. And if we just go back to square one, well, then we'll get it right. That's not true. Our problem is that the hypothesis misunderstands human nature because it assumes two things. Firstly, it assumes that power can be minimized. And secondly, it assumes that if worse comes to worse, the masses have the agency to push back against those in power. Let's talk about the first part. Let's talk about power. Power isn't a scary word. Evil is a scary word. Power is amoral. There's nothing inherently good or bad about power. And we all know this. We acknowledge this when we say, well, the only thing that can stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. And that's true. The guns are the power. And you're the good guy. He's the evil guy. But when we hear the word power in a political context, it scares us. And the reason for that is due to conditioning. It is due to the fact that for the last 70 years, especially, that power has always been used against us because it is power working on behalf of evil against the interests of our country and of our people. The point being that we have been convinced through conditioning that to take action is wrong because our allegiance should not be to good or at least to the elimination of evil, but rather to this abstract idea of the power vacuum. And in the meantime, we've been steamrolled by those acting on behalf of evil to where we are now, which is not exactly a good place to be in because they don't care about the power vacuum. They don't care about good, whereas we have allowed for the concept of the power vacuum to take precedence over good, which has damned us to our current situation. Now, the second part, the idea that the Second Amendment exists as a failsafe against the breach of the power vacuum, that has proven to be a failure as well, but for different reasons. The first premise has failed because it misunderstands human nature. It basically assumes the perfectibility of the individual, but this premise has failed because it did not take into account the reality of power and the ways in which those who have power will evolve in their strategies to maintain it over their populations. What I mean by this is that power, or I guess tyranny, is not simply being forced to do something. Maybe it was in the past. Now we live under a much more dangerous form of tyranny, which is more dangerous because the American regime uses its largely privatized infrastructure we're talking about media, private colleges, etc., to convince the masses of its narratives and of its hierarchy of meaning in the form of what are acceptable causes to which one should pledge themselves. And they all, in effect, serve the interests of the state in terms of expanding its power and wealth, all at the expense of its people, the American people. And this is why I've said before that the biggest takeaway from 1984 shouldn't be that, oh, the regime in power will use propaganda to keep people in line, but rather, oh, the regime in power will use propaganda to keep people in line, and it's going to work because the vast majority of people lack agency. And 1984 was a dystopian novel, so obviously it's exaggerated, but our propaganda is basically the same, except that it's much more subtle. And that actually ends up benefiting the establishment even more because people think that they're coming to these conclusions on their own accord, but they're not. They're not. So this is all to say that the Second Amendment as a failsafe can only work so long as you have a masses who recognize the importance of God-given rights, of their country, of preserving their culture, etc. But if you can indoctrinate a society into losing sight of that over the course of a few generations, and even further, you can completely and utterly emasculate the men, then you'll never have to worry about it. And even then... You can keep the Second Amendment relatively intact for the time being while you build the necessary infrastructure to do away with it entirely, as we talked about earlier, and it won't even matter because even the men who are considered to be masculine are going to be less masculine than previous generations, more demoralized and more disillusioned than previous generations, and also convinced of their freedom just because they hear a so-called conservative praise the Second Amendment on cable television a few times a month. 
But the reality is that they have deteriorated the Second Amendment into a cult because the American man does not know God and he does not know purpose. And so he fears death. He fears the reality of his own impermanence. And he copes with this by comforting himself with mass consumerism and mass media. This man would not storm the beaches of Normandy, but he's still basically the same as the men who did. But what's changed is the psychology behind the man. Both men probably don't know a whole lot about why they're doing what they're doing, right? But yet they represent opposite interpretations for dealing with the reality of our impermanence. And I've been thinking about this a lot recently because a friend of mine just died, 20 years old. That's not supposed to happen. Really makes you think about the reality of your impermanence. And as a man, you basically have two choices. You can either live in denial of the reality of death, which leads you to a life spent pursuing meaningless pleasures and distractions so as to minimize the anxiety that you feel about your death and about the meaninglessness of your existence. Or you can accept the reality of your death and choose to dedicate your life to something that is greater than yourself, to something that will exist long after you're gone, something like your family, something like the good of society. And that's the difference. The man who storms Normandy is a strong man who does not fear death, but rather he accepts it as an inevitability. And he uses the time that he does have to pursue what is good despite the pain and the sacrifice. And the man who binge watches Netflix fears death because it is a reminder that his life has no meaning because he is lazy and he is weak and afraid. And so he ignores this by pursuing meaningless pleasure, distractions, and perhaps drugs, pornography. Most importantly, he is reminded of his inadequacy by the existence of the strong man. And so he campaigns against him politically, socially, in every way possible. His own insecurity is projected onto the strong man and it occupies every aspect of his life. Every aspect of his life is dedicated to minimizing his anxiety and maximizing his comfort because he's been made weak in the same way that the strong man has been made strong because the problem is not that power exists in society. The problem is that right now, those who have power hate us and want to destroy our country. And in order to do that, they need to construct a society that breeds mental illness in weak men and a society that does that by convincing the masses that the only source of meaning in their lives can be serving the narratives that exist as an extension of the state, whereas 80 years ago when society taught men that their purpose was to protect women, protect the children, protect society, be good, be strong. That is how men found meaning in their lives. And we had a wonderful society as a result. Not perfect, but a thousand times better than we have now. And it gets back to what the society is promoting and who has the power. Because you could take men from the 1940s and tell them, gentlemen, tomorrow you will be shipped to France. Most of you you will die in service of your country, and in doing so, you will have kept your country and your family safe. May God be with you. And they all would have said whatever the 1940s equivalent was of, let's go, right? But now you take a group of men from the 2020s, you rob them of any semblance of meaning in their lives, and you fill that void with endless consumerism and media and drugs and porn, and you tell them that their purpose is to buy things, or their purpose is to fight for equality, whatever that means. They'll do it because they're weak, because they're starving for any meaning in their lives. The point being that because human nature dictates that the majority of men don't have complete age, Agency. They aren't seriously thinking about things. They aren't seriously analyzing things. Our job is not to force them to be intense, critical thinkers. No, our job is to create and maintain a society that allows them to find meaning in their lives through what is good. Because what we have now is the opposite. We have a society that promotes evil and self-destruction and men have followed suit. And so as a result, we're losing our country. So given that power is inevitable, we cannot sit back and watch evil take over because we're afraid and because we wish that everyone could just agree to maintain the power vacuum. We have to look at power and look at good as something to aspire to. And you use that power in society to promote good, just like how we used to generations ago. Our problem isn't that power exists. That's, that's unavoidable. Our problem is that the people in power are evil. And the way that they've created a society where men follow suit by slowly destroying themselves through their own nihilism and depression is the same way that we used to have a society where men would accept the reality of death. They would accept their role as a man and would use that for good and in the pursuit of something greater than themselves. And that is something to aspire to. The heroism of the 18-year-old who dies on the beach having left his girlfriend behind, the heroism of his friends and countrymen who honor that sacrifice. I would rather live to be 18 and die for a noble cause than live to be 100 but get to say that I've watched the the entire Netflix, Hulu, and Disney Plus catalog twice over. And I do think there's something noble about what I do, but I won't even pretend that it's even remotely in the same league as the sacrifices of the men who came before me. Not even close, but still better than not caring. Still better than keeping my mouth shut, right? I'll take the death threats. I'll take the never be able to get a normal job again because I truly feel that given my skills and the context in which I grew up, I'm probably doing my best right now. And I will always try to do that no matter what because I think that anything less is an unforgivable insult to the men who sacrifice so much to build this country. And I know I'm off topic right now, and I know it sounds dumb, like, oh, you mean your YouTube channel? Yeah, maybe. More specifically, I mean commanding the attention of tens of thousands of people every week, bringing people to Christ, getting people to liberate themselves from vice, helping people have discipline in their lives in order to pursue good in the optimal capacity. Like, yeah, you know, it's a YouTube channel. But I never got into this because I wanted to talk about why the minimum wage hurts the economy. That's important but I don't think it's nearly as important as what we talk about on this channel usually. And I hope that you guys have noticed that and I hope that you guys appreciate that. Like 
I'm literally here on my birthday doing this, right? 21st birthday, big deal. Because I love doing this. And there's very little that is more important to me than this. And so I'll finish by saying that I implore you to find out what this is to you, right? Especially if you're a man. I know I always talk about the boys. I'm biased towards the boys. I really sympathize with what we're going through. But ladies, you know, we love you too. We love our seven percenters. We cherish our seven percenters. And we're trying to make ourselves better so that we can create families with you. So in the meantime, lay off the TikTok, lay off the OnlyFans. Give us a second. We're trying to break the conditioning here. But I will say this to close. And that is that if you don't give men a purpose, if you don't promote a positive purpose for men in society, if you don't enable them to embrace their natural masculinity, then the society will be damned by the nihilistic insecurities of those men. If you displace men, you rob them of their purpose, those men will starve for meaning and they will happily submit and act on behalf of the state because they will have no true purpose no natural purpose, and so they will gravitate towards the welcoming arms of the regime. They will obey the siren's call, and they will pursue their own destruction while distracting themselves from the reality of the state of their existence. And this will serve to expand the power, wealth, and influence of that regime. And literally, there is only one thing that can break this cycle, and we talk about it all the time on the channel because of that fact, and if it makes you uncomfortable, consider the fact that that might be a result of your conditioning, but the only thing that can break this cycle is strong men with morals, discipline, and a purpose that is oriented selflessly towards those things, and the actualization of them throughout the society. Anything less than that will result in the continuation of our current state of existence, but more specifically, the continued degradation and decline of our current state of existence. Hey guys, if you like this video, leave it a thumbs up, leave it a comment, subscribe to the channel, turn on notifications, and share the video with a friend. We're going raspy voice mode. We're going many words mode. We're going, we do a little talk a lot. It's called, we do a little talking a lot. Ah. ASMR mode. We do a little ASMR mode. Heck off commie ASMR. The American regime, properly understood, is the enemy of its own population. I will now get my beverage, my my Big B coffee, Michigan nationalism, the coffee of the Great Lakes Federation for the, the heck off commie ASMR. The Second Amendment, properly understood in contemporary America, is not much else than a very significant and influential legal psyop. Thank you so much for watching, and may God bless America.